Yeah, thank you and thanks Sebastian for this nice introduction. This talk will be about architectures and Angular. And as mentioned, I am Manfred, I am a trainer and consultant for Angular. I'm doing a lot of in-house trainings and in-house consultancy. And I'm also part of the Google Developer Expert team. My current product is also about Angular. It's a workshop about Angular in the enterprise. And we are doing this as in-house or as public workshop. So let me start this talk with a question. Have you ever started a project from the scratch? Who did this? Yeah, cool, most of you. And in this case, you know, starting a project from the scratch is exciting. At the first day, it looks like this. You have this green field and you feel that everything is possible. And then after some weeks, it looks like this. Very cute. It is doing exactly what it is supposed to do. Nice design, nice functionality, great performance. But after some years, it will look like this. And no, this isn't me at college. This is the Frankenstein monster, perhaps you know it. The Frankenstein monster that was assembled of different body parts of different people. Things that didn't belong together. And you have really take care about this, because this shall not happen to your next project. And in this talk, I will present you three ideas of how to prevent this Frankenstein. The first idea is using NPM packages. The second is about the monorepo, and the third one is about using microapps. And in the end, I will give you some advice about how to choose for this or that approach. But first things first, let's talk about NBM packages. The idea here is that we subdivide a big project into tinier parts, tinier parts that can be developed more or less individually, and at the end you are pulling them all together. And using packages is quite simple nowadays, because starting with CLI 6, it is baked into the CLI. We can create a new project with the CLI, and within the project, we can create sub-projects like libraries or applications. This is everything you need to do to create a library or an application as a sub-project. Here, the application is just a playground application, something that allows me to test my code. Of course, every one of us is writing unit tests and end-to-end -end tests, I have no doubt. But uh, in addition to that, I'm also using my playground application. Then you can serve the playground application, and of course, you can build your library. And then the CLI creates something that aligns with the Angular package format a huge specification that tells you how a library has to look like to work seamlessly with Angular and all its optimization techniques. And then you can move to the distribution folder and publish everything to your registry. It's nowadays as simple as that. And of course, this has some advantages. For instance, one advantage is you can distribute your source code your reusable source code, and you can version it. That means every time you are publishing your package, it gets a new version, and so the consumer can decide upon whether to go with the newest version or with an older one. Those are the advantages, but there are also some disadvantages, and they can be found on the next slide. They can be found here. So. As it turns out, all those advantages are at the same time disadvantages. Let me elaborate a bit on this. For instance, when it comes to distribution, it's a disadvantage because talking to your colleagues, talking to yourselves by the means of a registry is somehow annoying. It is annoying because it means every time you fix a bug, you have to assign a new version, you have to publish your package, and then your colleagues have to install the latest version. And of course, this is happening time and again, and that's why it's annoying. And on the other side, versioning can be a drawback, because versioning means you can have old versions out there. And old versions means you can have version conflicts. Somehow, it's 
the case that within one project, you want to force everyone into using the latest versions. This is not necessarily true when it comes to other projects you are sharing your code with, but within one project, you just want to have one and only one version per each dependency. Yeah, and this is why some people invented the next approach I want to present to you, the second approach. It is called the monorepo approach. A monorepo is quite a simple thing. It's more or less a big folder with subfolders, and each and every subproject of your big software system goes there. That means you can still subdivide your big application into tinier parts. Tinier parts that are subprojects in this structure. The best thing about this is this node modules folder. Not the fact that it ex exists, but the uh, fact that it exists just once. There is just one node modules folder, and that means that each and every application here is using the same dependencies. This, of course, one more time prevents version conflicts. Just assume what would happen if this library would use Angular 5 and that application would use Angular 7. And then imagine you are using both together, you are compiling both together. I guarantee you hell would break loose in this case. And this is prevented here by this global nodes modules folder. So let's have a look at the advantages. First of all, we don't have version conflicts because everyone is using the latest version of all the libraries. The latest versions are just in the folder next to yours, point, point, slash, project name, and so on. You don't have the burden with distributing libraries because they are just a folder in your monorepo structure. Creating a new library is as easy as creating a new folder. It's a piece of cake. And there is a lot of experience out there, for instance, at Google or Facebook. Those companies are using this concept for years very, very heavily. But also in some other areas, it's quite common to have something like a monorepo. Who of you is using .NET? Yeah, some of you. In .NET or in general, in the Microsoft environment, we have this concept for about two decades. It's called a solution, a Visual Studio solution, and it is nothing else than a monorepo that consists of several further projects belonging together, forming a bigger software system. Or perhaps you've worked with Eclipse. In Eclipse, there is also this notation of a workspace. And an Eclipse workspace is nothing else than a Mono repository. One nice thing here is that the Mono repository is not a one-way street. You can move back and forth all the time. That means you can start with your Mono repo, and at a later point in time, you can export parts of the Mono repo to an NPM registry. So you can share your code with other project teams. You have it within your uh, Mono repo, but the other teams take it out of the registry. To be honest, this is exactly how Angular is built. Angular is built within a big mono repository, and when they are releasing a new version, they are exporting everything for us, for the rest of the world, to NPM. Nice, so we found another solution. Uh, it's nearly a perfect solution, isn't it? We can now subdivide our big system into tinier parts, and we don't have the burden with distributing library. Those are the advantages, but there are also some disadvantages, and they can be found on the next slide. They can be found here. So, one more time, it turns out that having a lot of tiny subsystem is also a disadvantage, because normally they are talking to each other. And talking to each other means there are contracts, and contracts cannot be changed easily. If you don't trust me, just try to change your renting contract or your marriage contract in the next break. It isn't easy at all. You have to do discussions, you have to find new solutions, and so on. And this is especially problematic when you have several teams involved. 
and it uh, slows down maintainability because you cannot change anything that easily and it also means that you have one big overall architecture and one overall framework. You cannot easily change these two. And when we now think about enterprise systems, then we have to think about systems that need to be maintained for 10 or 15 or 20 years. And no one knows what happens in, let's say, seven years. No one knows if the current architecture, the current framework is suitable for the use cases we have to implement then. And there's exactly where the third approach comes in I have prepared for you. It's called the micro-apps approach. The idea of micro-apps is quite easy. You are subdividing a big system into several tiny independent systems. That means those systems do not know much of each other and they do not communicate much to each other. Of course, sometimes they have to use some interfaces, but in general they are self-contained and they can live, they can be executed without the others. This concept is quite modern now in the world of the backend. There you will call it microservices. In the front end, you might call it micro front ends, or like you see here, micro apps. And of course, now the question arises how to implement a micro app. And one solution can be found at Google. At Google, we are finding a lot of simple apps like Google Maps. It is a self-contained app. It is uh, created for one use case, for dealing with map and uh, dealing with routes. And when you want to move to another application, you're just using hyperlinks like those here on the right side. That means you can easily end up with several tiny, independent, flexible, single-page applications. Each and every of those simple-page applications can have its own architecture, its own tech stack. By the way, the most important aspect of the whole presentation can be found on this slide here. If you forget everything, please ever remember this aspect. I'm very proud of it. I'm putting a lot of emphasis into it. In Germany, to be more precise, in Lower Saxony, there is a village called Steierberg. That's very exciting to have my name in it, and that's why for me this is very important. Is someone here from Germany? No one? Okay. So if you watch this on YouTube, I love you guys. You are the best. Thank you. Okay, using hyperlinks is one approach. Another approach would be to create a shell, a shell that is capable of loading other single-page applications on demand. You can do this with iframes. That means you can load legacy applications. Or something that would be a better solution, you can bootstrap several independent single-page applications. That means you have one index HTML, and in this index HTML, you load similar, uh, several uh, different single page applications on demand. So please also consider using lazy loading here to take care about the start performance. And for this, I have prepared a demonstration. Let's have a look at a sample application I've prepared. This here is my sample application. It's written with Angular, and it is just a shell. You could call it a browser in the browser. It just contains the overall architecture. And when you click here or there, you are loading independent applications, independent Angular applications. That means those applications can be developed independently. They can be uh, deployed independently. And when they have deployed, the shell is just grabbing the newest version and then loading it into its working area. You can even start it independently and test it independently without uh, the need of communication with other product teams. Here I'm loading a second application. It's my RAD Angular client. And let's click here. Oh, what's happened here? I promise you, I don't know this logo because I'm an Angular guy. I don't know what this logo is about. But 
in my point of view, this really shows, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> This really shows that we can now mix and match technologies for our sub-projects. And one more time, not because we want to, but because we have to when it comes to software that needs to be maintained over years or decades. Is any one of you using AngularJS 1? Okay. In this case, you have here a nice upgrade strategy. Just load your Angular JS1 part into such a mono repo, no, in such a micro application architecture. In addition to that, you can also use web components to reuse widgets within other clients. For instance, here I am reusing a widget from the green client, I'm reusing a widget from the vanilla JS client, and I'm reusing one from my blue Angular client. This is how to bridge the gap for these uh, web components are very, very in handy. Okay, now I have presented you three options to subdivide a big project into tiny parts. And of course, now the question arises, which one is the right solution for us? And this question is quite difficult to answer because, as you have seen before, each approach has its very own advantages as well as its very own disadvantages. And that means when discussing about this, you will very likely end up in cycles. At least this was the experience I got when discussing this with a lot of customers. And that's why I've created a decision tree. A decision tree that helps you to find a first good architectural candidate. Of course, it is not the last word on this, but it proved to be in handy. The first question I would ask you is, do you have a lot of shared state? Or do your users need to navigate around a lot? Do they have to switch the micro app a lot? And if you say no, this is not the case or just rarely, then go with hyperlinks. Great individual single page applications. This is the simplest solution and you have all the other solutions for later. You can switch to them. If you say yes, there is a lot of navigation and a lot of shared state. Then the next question is, do you need to integrate legacy applications or third-party vendor applications? Normally, when integrating third-party vendor applications, you need a very good isolation so they, that they cannot hack you. And in this case, consider iframes, but also consider this is not a good fit for public websites. You will not win an architectural award by using iframes. If you say no, no legacy, no third party vendors, then the next question is, do you even need a separate deployment or a mix of technologies? And when you say yes, then bootstrap several single page applications. Here you could also consider web components. And if you say no, then go with a mono repo, then just create one well-designed big piece of software. If you say, hey, that was a great talk, then you will find some additional stuff on my blog. I've written a lot of, about this because this is currently one of my main topics. And even though you are saying, hey, that was an awful dog, check my blog out anyway. Perhaps I'm writing better, who knows? <laughs> so let me come to a conclusion. We have seen you can use packages for providing reusable code. You can use mono repos to structure a big application to subdivide it in tinier parts. And you can use micro apps for decoupling. That means you're ending up with decoupled teams, but also with decoupled projects. And one last thing I want you to remember, please beware the Frankenstein monster. Make sure that your next client application is like this guy here. So thanks for having me. Here you find all my contact data. You find my slides and samples on my blog. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out on Twitter or something else. So thanks for coming. If you want, let's keep in touch on Twitter. Have a nice day.